So um, I was 15 years old when I first heard, when I was first asked if I was a feminist. I had just walked I had just walked out of a three-day-old marriage. I was 15 years old. I got myself a divorce, and people wondered how a 15-year-old could ask for a divorce. And they asked me, "What books are you reading that makes you a feminist?" And I, in all my 15 years of adulthood, I said, "Nancy Drew and Enid Blyton." That was not feminism there. And as for, are you a feminist? I vehemently denied being one. Uh, I did not want to be a feminist. I didn't, I, I was the scared, the gaze shifting, the man fearing, the eat only after the man, kind of the, you know, the good woman everybody wanted to be. I was not a feminist, no sir. And when, uh, people asked me if, and I did not want equal, I did not want feminism in my life. I, I wanted to be a person, a people pleaser where everybody liked me. And uh, it was the most shameful to be the loud, the armpit bearing, the red lipstick wearing, the breast owning feminist that everyone was used to. And least of all, I wanted to be one. The best thing that a divorce did to me, the best thing that a divorce did to me at 15 was it bought me time. The time to plan of things other than pleasing a man. And then I fell in love with journalism and writing. But I was denied the freedom to choose the subject that I wanted to study because of my gender. I was told I would be meeting strange men. I would be traveling at odd hours. I would be talking to men in hotels and restaurants, questioning them, meeting them in their offices. Not good for a good Muslim woman. And so they said, no journalism, not for you. That was my starkest memory of being denied Something that I loved, I wanted, because of my gender. That was my first eye to eye with feminism. And embroidery was passed on to me from an all-girls girl, all convent school that I went to. They also taught me to sit with my legs closed. My uh, sp speak only when you are spoken to. Uh, your wild hair out of your eyes, please. Be ladylike. Do not run when you can walk. And embroidery was one, another one that they passed on to me. And outside school, embroidery was smiled benevolently upon because it was a very ladylike, a domestic, a docile uh, activity that you could do sitting at home. And it, it taught women to be quiet, to follow a pattern, to link yourself to being at home, not outside doing activities that moved you too much and showed off how curvy your body is. And it was, it was a very domestic, quiet activity that women were encouraged to take up in, in most of the schools and at home, it was your certificate to marriageability. And with patterns, usually, I'm sure a lot of you remember, pattern, you had pattern books that you could buy for embroidery that made sure that you followed a pattern, you stuck to it, and usually, uh, if you look at cross stitch, it's counted, there's, there's not much scope for going wild with your ideas. And most of the vintage and early uh, embroidery work that you, the patterns that were made available to you, it consistently consisted of flowers, birds, butterflies, a lot of uh, happy apron wearing women, beautiful babies 
and mostly uh, a lot of these had uh, something called domestic chow charts, which was a very common pattern that was made available to you. On Monday, you ironed your clothes. On Tuesday, you washed it. On Thursday, you swept the floor. So you knew where, we, where you were going. And then you all, all, always had the cute kittens, the birds, the butterflies, the ducklings, and the domestic chores that reminded you where you were headed to. You get the idea. And I'm sorry. And for a short time, I stopped doing embroidery because I confused feminism as not allowing you to be feminine. You had to be this loud, angry, uh, roaring feminist that was always angry and teaching people what it is to be equal. And, and embroidery was nothing of that sort. You were sitting in a nice chair, probably a bird or two singing in the background. There was fluttering. Uh, your curtains were fluttering and you sat and you embroidered and then somebody would bring you tea. That was my idea of embroidery. But it took me some time to realize that the stereotype was not how you were embroidering. It is not about how your body was when you embroidered, how quiet you were or how you were sitting down. But it was of what we were embroidering. We were refusing to put out questions. We were refusing to change the patterns. We kept doing what our grandmothers and our mothers and teachers passed on to us. We were embroidering the same roses, the same kittens, the same uh, fruit baskets, the same good night on the pillow covers. We just refused to get out of it. And that was when I also uh, realized there was a brewing feminism that was happening in the craft world. Women had started taking up uh, embroidery and speaking about women's rights issues. A lot of uh, fights were going on. People were discussing it. Uh, and when you, when you I, I studied English literature in college, and uh, one stark memory of Homer's Iliad was that every time a woman character walked out into the man's world or the man's atmosphere to talk to him, she was constantly reminded to get back to your weaving and stay out of man's business. And then I met Madame Defarge. Madame Defarge is a character in the tale of two cities. She is never shown without her knitting. And she was not knitting booties, she was not knitting throws, she was not knitting caps for children. She was knitting for her revolutionary convictions. She was knitting the names of the people she would kill or the people that were killed in the French Revolution that she was a part of. And then I met the suffragist moment, movement, uh, which happened around the 20th century, where women, uh, the right for women's votes were being spoken of. And I learned that around 150 banners were hand-stitched and hand-embroidered to take part in the protests and marches that were going on uh, during that time for the fight for the women's right to vote. And this, this here, this was done uh, by the prisoners of the uh, Holloway prison who were imprisoned due to their suffragist strikes. And they embroidered the names of every person, the atrocities that were done to them to keep record for the future generations on how the fight has been. Sorry. And, uh, and then, uh, meanwhile, the man's art, painting, sculpting, uh, building, music, these were being debated. They were being displayed. 
they were finding their space in media, they were, they were talking politics, they were getting fought over for, they, they are being sold for millions. While the women's art, which was, which is crocheting, lace work, embroidery, dressmaking, weaving, quilting, where were we? We, we were just uh, making daily use items that remained daily use, that never went anywhere, nobody spoke about it. It wasn't sold for millions of dollars. We weren't talking politics, we weren't, we did not have, it was unworthy of vision, space, money, media, we were missing out on the entire area. Okay. Although I have been embroidering off and on since school, I did not realize for a long time that embroidery was my loudest and strongest voice. And it, that was when I decided to take up 100 days of creativity and feminism. It was also my effort to understand feminism because feminism to me is still a very wide subject. It's very intriguing. It's very complex because I also realize that feminism changes from person to person, from where you come from, your religion, your society, everything, your economical status, your caste, everything changes what feminism is to you. And the deeper you go in, the more confusing it is because there's no there are no check boxes in feminism. So, and as I started learning, I, I decided I needed to put it out a bit more uh, easier to understand. So when I, I wanted to present it in a way that people looked at it and understood what feminism was about. This, and in the series, in the process of doing the series, these are a few that I had come across. Uh, this was one of my most discussed about uh, artwork, the OMKV. It was pointing where the sexes should be heading to. Uh, I did a couple on body shaming, which is a big uh, topic of discussion nowadays. Uh, and this was my uh, tribute to the suffragist, uh, suffragist poster uh, movement. I reproduced a poster as it is. Uh, this was, I also did a series on uh, women who are not spoken about, who are uh, mostly forgotten, not Malala. Uh, I included her because it was her birthday yesterday. Uh, so uh, I, I did a series on uh, women who were, uh, who are not so well known. So two of them was Pumade Pannamma and Kodarani uh, of the Kerala dynasties. Mm, and then I also included, uh, inclusiveness is another part of feminism that's most often not looked into, transgenders, LGBTIQ uh, people. Uh, I also tried to delve into what feminism uh, is for them and what it makes them. Reproductive rights, uh, one of the most ignored parts of feminism, the right to choose whether you want a child, whether you want to have sex, whether you have the right to say no, uh, the freedom to bleed, it's, uh, that was another one. I also uh, went through uh, feminism in common comics. Uh, I, I find Bob and Molly one of the most, the women uh, were very, very strong, <laughs> very free, uh, loud, uh, breaking all barriers. The other one is from Persepolis. Uh, I, I connect a lot to it. Uh, Calvin and Hobbes, of course, my favorite. <laughs> and, and this uh, one is uh, from a friend. She... Uh, does cartoons on uh, relevant issues. So um, it's been a, a long journey and uh, Feminici was 
uh, a term that I started identifying myself and my series with in the journey. Uh, it was my effort, it was a conscious effort that I took uh, to cut away the edge of being called a feminici because feminici carried with it the idea that feminists were angry, loud, uncouth, always uh, yapping, unintelligent women who had nothing better to do but hate men. I, I took the idea, I was inspired by the uh, pussy uh, hat march and the slut walk, which has succeeded in taking away the edge, the sexist, ageist, the misogynist edge of calling women words that starts denoting them as something negative. And I believe that right now femininity is something that I carry with a lot of pride. And a lot of my friends also carry with a lot of pride. Uh, and so if you ever decide to craft or embroider, get your supplies. Remember what an amazing, intricate, complex person you are. Speak about yourself in politics, in science, in maths, in history, in music, in art. Speak about yourself, speak about the women around you, the forgotten ones, the unforgotten ones, the not so warrior ones, people who have worked to make a change. And use colors if you want to or not. And if you like the set patterns of birds and butterflies and cute little kittens, use them, but don't get stuck with them. Find new designs, talk about new theories, fiddle with new ideas. Be unscared of telling the world what you really think should be. And don't let history forget what craft has done for you. It gave us a voice when we did not have one. Thank you.